we are calling on you now to bring us once again to the cross where we see our Jesus, where we see redemption, where we see forgiveness, atonement. So Lord, um, draw us once again uh, to the Savior. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's Good Friday. I remember as a little boy, there was a Good Friday uh, where it snowed. And the weather was absolutely uh, crummy and nobody, nobody came to worship. But it was still Good Friday. Today, it's a virus. Not many are here uh, for worship, but it's still Good Friday. We remember this day here in a worship center, or we can remember it at home. Th those in the United States Navy, in a submarine, way down deep in the ocean, it's Good Friday. Men and women who find themselves behind bars, it's Good Friday. It's a day in which we look back at that Friday. And no plague no war, no natural disaster, no ocean depth, no prison bars can change the fact that Jesus Christ died for the forgiveness of all of our sins. And so today on this Good Friday, I want to go to the Gospel of Matthew. This past week, I've been making my way through Matthew chapters 26 and, and 27, and I want to finish uh, today, by looking at the crucifixion and death of Jesus from Matthew chapter 27, beginning at verse 32. And, and again, I invite you to follow along in your own Bibles. So here we go, Matthew 27, verse 32. It says, And as they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. Executions always took place outside of the city, both for the Jews and also for the Romans. But first, the victim was made to walk through the most populous streets. And then they would go outside of the city. And, and usually the place of execution was right by a highway. The question is why? Well, the Romans, they wanted as many people as possible to, to see the victim both making uh, his or her way through the streets of Jerusalem and then outside of the city, up on a hill. It was their way of saying, don't, don't you mess with Rome. And, and we want to know, don't we? Did J Jesus, did he carry the entire cross? Or did he just carry the cross piece? Does it really matter? We know that his body was torn apart by the scourging, and it would have been difficult simply to walk, never mind carrying anything. And he couldn't. He couldn't carry that piece of wood. And so the Bible says a man named Simon was forced to carry the cross for Jesus. Forced. Because no Jew would touch a cross. It was accursed. Verse 33. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Golgotha, in the Greek, it's cranion, from which we get the English word cranium. It's the place of the cranium, the place of the skull. That's where Jesus was crucified, and more than likely, it looked like a skull. And then verse 34, There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. They wanted to give Jesus doped wine, but he refused. Matthew says it was wine mixed with gall. Matthew says that it was bitter. It was wine that was mixed with myrrh. And, and, and this doping, this, this wine mixed with gall, it wasn't an act of mercy. No, it just simply made the executioner's job easier. And so the Bible says Jesus was repeatedly asked 
to receive this drink, and repeatedly Jesus refused. He wanted to go through this final ordeal with a clear mind. And he wanted to be able to speak powerful words. Verse 35, when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The Romans were known for their gambling. At times they would uh, put the lots in a helmet and move the helmet around and one of the lots would fly out of the helmet, that person would win. Or they would simply reach into the helmet and, and pull out a lot. Folks, sometimes we, we tend to focus on the gambling. But what is really important is that this was prophesied in the Old Testament. Psalm 22, verse 18. They would gamble for his clothing. And then verse 36. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. This implies that the bloody work had been completed. All that needed to be done was to guard the cross from any kind of interference. And there would have been four executioners there, plus a, a, a Roman guard led by a centurion. And verse 37, Above his head they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. In the Gospel of John, we, we get the full story that, that it was Pilate who placed this on the cross above the head of Jesus. And, and the Jews, they didn't want that. They didn't want this sign and what it said. But Pilate didn't listen. It contained the charge or the indictment against Jesus. His crime? He was the king of the Jews. So in some respects, Pilate had his revenge on these Jews they would have their king on a cross. And only as a king. Only as their king. Verse 38. Two rebels were crucified with him. One on his right and one on his left. Again, to fulfill Scripture. That, that, that he was crucified with one on his right and one on his left fulfills Isaiah 53, verse 12. That he was numbered with the transgressors. And again, why did Pilate want this? Two robbers crucified with Jesus. And again, to insult the Jews and to degrade their king, even in crucifixion. Verse 39, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads. They would shake their heads. It would mean no. No to Jesus being king. And remember the charges against Jesus. If you go back in the Gospel of Matthew, the one charge was that he would destroy the temple and that he would rebuild it. The other, uh, the other charge was that he claimed to be the Son of God. And so they mocked him. And verse 40 says, And saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. And again, there are the two charges. He claimed that he would destroy the temple, rebuild it. He claimed to be the Son of God. And they're simply saying, if that's true, come on down. Verse 41, in the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. And, and, and when Matthew speaks of those three groups of people, he's talking about the Jewish religious body called the Sanhedrin. And they too were there to watch. The religious leaders. And they couldn't get close enough to spit on him. But they could still hurl their insults. Verse 42. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. He saved others but he can't save himself. They were mocking all the miracles of Jesus. Everything he had done. They, they were mocking it all. And, and again, they were simply saying, look, if, if you can do this, come on down. If you are the Son of God, save yourself. Verse 43, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And this Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, they were simply saying, look, he calls God Father. Why doesn't the Father come down now and save him, bring him down from the cross? 
And with their eyes, they could see that Jesus was still there. So it must not have been true, according to them, that He was the Son of God. And then verse 44, in the same way, the rebels who were crucified with Him also heaped insult on Him. Both robbers joined in the mockery, but we know from the Gospel of Luke that one of them, his heart was changed and he reached out to Jesus. From Luke's Gospel, we find out that even the Romans joined in mocking Jesus. And then verse 45, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. First miracle in in connection with the crucifixion of Jesus, darkness from the sixth hour, noon, until the ninth hour, three in the afternoon. And, And those who study this, they know that it could not have been a natural eclipse of the sun. God did it. And why the darkness for three hours, we're not told. Some believe that it was a a moral reaction against the killing of Jesus. But more than likely, the darkness signified judgment. There was a judgment happening. Joel 2, verse 31, it says, The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And then verse 46, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Darkness and this agonized cry, they go together. And at the climax of the sign of judgment, Jesus cried out. Matthew and Mark, they preserve it in the original. In Matthew's Gospel, it's Eli, which is Hebrew. In Mark's Gospel, it's Eloi, which is Aramaic. And you'll find those words in Psalm 22, verse 1. Folks, Jesus did not speak these words because David wrote them. This was actually happening to Jesus. The Father turned His back. He abandoned His one and only Son. Jesus was forsaken at this moment. A wall of separation had arisen between the Father and the Son. And that wall, it was our sin. And and even though God turned from him, Jesus still turns to him and cries out to him, my God. Instead of why, it can be translated for what purpose? You see, to be forsaken by God was to taste his wrath. And, and, And during those moments when Jesus cried out, the full wrath of God was poured out on Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. He tasted death. He tasted wrath so that we wouldn't have to. So that we would be forgiven. Verse 47, when some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. No, he wasn't. He said, Eli. The the, the word for Elijah is Eliyahu. They knew that, but again, they were simply mocking Jesus. You see, they understood that it would be Elijah who would come and introduce the Messiah, and it would be Elijah who would stand right beside Jesus. And so they were mocking him and saying, hey, it must be Elijah that he's calling. That Elijah would stand with him now. And then verse 48, immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on his staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. And at this moment, insert John 19, 28 and 29, Jesus said, I thirst. He, he didn't want to sink slowly into unconsciousness. He wanted to die with a loud shout of triumph. And Jesus asked for a drink so that that last cry would be strong, that it would be bold. And one of them, a Roman soldier, had some sour wine. Put it on a reed, the hyssop plant, only about 18 inches long, and gave this drink to Jesus. In verse 49, the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And and they keep up with the mockery. They continue to mock Jesus. And I want you to understand something. Those were the last words Jesus heard 
when he died. He heard his creation mocking him. He heard his people deriding him. Those are the last words. Verse 50, it says, When Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. John alone records these words, It is finished. Luke records the final words, Into your hands I commit my spirit. Matthew simply says, He cried out again in a loud voice. In verse 51, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks split. If the sun failing to shine was the first miracle, this was the second. The curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. From top to bottom, signifying this was an act of God. Signifying that not just a priest would go into the Holy of Holies, but we were all welcomed. We could all go in the name of Jesus before the Father. And then the Bible says that there was this earthquake. The earth shook, the third miracle. And then the last one, verse 52. And the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. With verse 53, they came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Isn't that amazing? After the resurrection of Jesus, those saints who had been dead... They came back to life. And and, and so my question is, how is it possible that there were still people who didn't believe in Jesus? He walked on water. He had power over nature. He healed the lepers. He had power over disease. He cast out demons. He had power over darkness. He raised people from the dead. He had power over death. And now, people who had died were walking around town. And I'm sure some would have recognized, there's Joe. Joe. We went to his funeral. He's alive. There's Susanna. She was dead. And and now she's alive. How is it possible that everybody didn't believe? Here's what Jesus says in Luke 16, 31. He said to the people, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. But folks, the last verse, verse 54, there was a centurion who saw and heard. And I'm just praying boldly that tonight you have seen and you have heard and that God is working in your heart and your life because this centurion, he saw all that has happened and he exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. And there it is. Matthew 27, verses 32 to 54. The Son of God dying on a cross. And there is nothing glamorous about the words I just shared with you from the Gospel of Matthew. I I, I don't believe that, that, that we can even begin to fathom the immensity of the darkness, the pain, and the brutality that occurred on that Good Friday. And that's what makes that last verse that I shared, as the candles were being extinguished, so strange. Once again, Galatians 6, verse 14, Paul writes, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul is saying, if I'm going to boast about anything, I'm not going to boast about my credentials, I'm not going to boast about my accomplishments, I'm going to boast about the cross of Jesus. And so why? Why would you boast about a cruel instrument of torture? Two hymns came to mind. Lift high the cross. Why would we lift it high? In the cross of Christ, I glory. Why would we glory in it? Well, we lift it up high. We glory in it. Not just because of what happened at the cross, but what happened for us. You see, here is our dilemma, maybe especially at a time like this. We would like to believe that God is good and that He always has our good in mind. And then a virus attacks. People lose their lives and their livelihood, and and, and we begin to wonder just how good this God is. And that's the danger of basing God's character upon our circumstances. Then God is only good when... Things are good. Martin Luther once said, the flesh 
cries out against the belief that God is good. You see, our humanity sees all that is happening today and we wonder if God is good and our flesh cries out against that notion. But he continues, but the suffering Savior brings consolation that this is indeed true. That's where we end up on this Good Friday, below a cross, with this centurion, surely, the Son of God. And you see this suffering Savior, and when you begin to understand that it was not only happening, but it was happening for us, that you begin, just begin to understand the immensity of God's grace, His undeserved love, that, that He would do this, that He would give up His Son, that he would fix the time, the moment. This was his moment to redeem all people, including you and me. And when you see that, when you stand below that cross in the midst of all that is happening, you understand our God is good. He would enter a broken world, take the brokenness upon himself, and die for it all so that we would be able to live with him forever. In Jesus' name, let's come before the Lord in this word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you now on this Good Friday, and Lord, you have brought us to the word, the gospel of Matthew, that right at this moment before us, before our eyes and our ears, our minds and our hearts, that we would behold the suffering Savior. And we would understand how good and gracious you are. That's what you would do for our salvation. That's what you would do for our forgiveness. That's what you would do so that we would have the assurance that we would live with you forever. Lord, how we thank and praise you for this Good Friday. How we thank and praise you for that Friday when you did all. When your son cried out, it is finished. Our salvation is complete. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Receive this blessing as it comes from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor, grant you his peace. Amen.